Well, welcome and thanks uh, to all of you uh, in person and those of you uh, on Zoom attending this evening's talk on strategies for financial success. And uh, my name is Eric Worley. I'm an associate professor here at Western and uh, it's great to see some familiar faces in the room. And uh, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Paul Merriman. Um, he, uh, Paul graduated from Western in 1966 and uh, is an award-winning financial educator, uh, author, and nationally recognized expert on investing. He retired in 2012 from the wealth management uh, company he founded in 1983, but since then he's been busier than ever. <laughs> Driven by a passion for financial education, he established the Paul Merriman Financial Education uh, fi Foundation and has dedicated his retirement years to providing investors of all ages with information and tools, free information and tools. And uh, these tools can help you make informed decisions uh, in your own best interest and successfully implement your own retirement savings program. His foundation also supports uh, personal finance education here uh, via two courses, personal finance and personal investment, which I encourage you to take if you haven't already. Uh, Paul and his, home, his small home-based team have produced hundreds of weekly podcasts, market watch articles and videos, uh, along with books, articles by experts, and unique research to help you make wise financial investment decisions. After this talk, I encourage you to check out the free resources available on his website, paulmerriman.com, if you're interested in diving deeper into what you learned tonight. And as a fellow Viking, Paul cares deeply about your future, and we are grateful to have him here to share his insights and advice on creating a successful financial future. And with that, I will hand it over. Please welcome Paul Mary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I, I, I love the fact that I'm here. It's, it's uh, so many reasons. This last Saturday, I did the first presentation live in front of people uh, for over two years. And uh, we had uh, some 200 and 50 people in the room, and we had uh, 400 and some online, and uh, it just doesn't get any better than this. I got to tell you, I don't know about you, but Zoom has been amazing for the work that we do because it allows us to, to reach people so efficiently. And, uh, but I am glad to be here. I am absolutely uh, tied to this school. I came here when I was 19, I was married had my first child here, our first child when I was 21, uh, and, uh, and actually became a dear friend of one of my professors uh, who had remained a dear friend uh, our entire lives. And so I have so many attachments here that when I sold our business uh, that we had built up over 30 years, I talked to my wife and I, I talked about the idea of setting up uh, a scholarship fund for, for Western students. And she egged me on. In fact, she kind of teased me and said, you surely can do more than that. And what ended up coming out of that was not only the commitment to uh, underwrite the personal, in, uh, personal investing 216. Anybody had it, by the way, taken the course? Not uh, one person. Okay, good. I hope it helped. Uh, you'll recognize some of this, I'm sure. But um, it, it, uh, it, it, it was really why our foundation was formed, uh, to be able to fund this project. And that led to three free books. And that led to an invite to write for Dow Jones. And that led to a weekly podcast. And that led to finding some people who were willing to work with me uh, donating their time. We have the most amazing research staff producing uh, tables to help investors uh, take better care of their money to understand the process. Now, I want to apologize right now about this presentation. I want to, I, I, I want to be up front. This is not everything you need to know about personal finance. This is not everything you need to know about all the major steps that you're going to take in your financial future. But it is my view that one of the biggest challenges that you have, and one of the reasons I'm so supportive of personal investing 216, is that the world since I was here has become so unbelievably different. If I looked at, in fact, I had, I had breakfast with uh, 
uh, two uh, fellow Westernites uh, Vikings this morning in Stanwood. And we were talking about what life was like in 1966 when we were going to school here and what life was like as we were coming out. Most of us came out and went to work someplace where there was a pension. Over 50% of people uh, in America had pensions, working people. And, and today it is around 5%. So what did they do? Instead of writing the check for you and putting it away for you and managing it for you, they don't even pay you anything unless you put money in yourself. And then when you put it in, you have to make the decision where to invest it. And I will tell you the outcome is amazingly different when you do it and when they do it. And it's not because you're well-intentioned, but you are like a doctor doing surgery on a family member. It's a really emotional relationship with money that we have. And when you've made an investment and that investment is going down instead of up, and you really don't understand exactly what you've done, then it's easy to panic and sell and do the very thing that's worst for you. But the most human thing, I mean, the normal thing to do to protect what is yours and is so near and dear to you. So my job and our job as a foundation is to educate people about what we consider to be some of the biggest decisions you're going to make. And, and, and those decisions have to do with where you put your 401k or do you use an IRA? And, and there'll be a lot of other decisions. You're going to have to make decisions about paying off your, paying off your debt. I'm going to address that briefly. Briefly because, in a sense, every one of you has a different story to tell. And all you have to do is to read, and I've got some links for you, articles by some organizations that are pretty well uh, established in that decision-making process because I'm not sure that I would solve your problem as well as they, because they will talk about you in the way you are, not in the way I would talk about some generic individual. But I am going to focus what I think are the biggest financial decisions, and I am going to show you some simple steps. And, I, and, 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 and I'm not selling anything. you got to understand that. I'm not here to get you to buy anything from me. We have nothing for sale. In fact, you got a free book. And my hope is that book will, will be really meaning for you, meaningful for you and maybe your family and maybe your kids someday. But before I get into this, this, this discussion of investing, oh, and I started to say, I'll show you a strategy that with a few, a relatively few dollars early in your career, I believe it is legitimate when you go through your retirement years that you will receive some $15 million in income in retirement. And it will be legitimate at the end of your life if you live to be 95, because that's what we use in the study. By the way, you're expected, many of you in this room, to live to be 95. In fact, our kids... Our kids now are expected, 50% of them, to live to be 103. That's a lot of years on Social Security and retirement. You better have some money to pay for it. But this strategy that I will share with you, I'll be writing about in an article in the next week. So if you want to read more, I'll do a podcast on it in the next week. You want to listen to more, I, I, I hope you will come to our website and, and uh, take part with this information that's meant to help you be a better investor. I'm not a speculator. I am an investor. Now, what does that mean? We recently read a survey that said that young people believe that cryptocurrencies were less risky than the S&P 500, the index that is the benchmark for the US economy. How many agree that cryptocurrency, out of curiosity, is less risky than the S&P 500? Can I see the hands? How many would have said so about a month ago before it 
or, or two months ago before it fell by over 50%. It's a lot easier to believe in stuff than it's going up than when it's going down. But I am not a fan of cryptocurrency because I have absolutely no way to understand the product, to give it any historical meaning, to be able to test its past returns. Because today the returns I'll be talking about are over 90 years. And of course, I, I believe the longer we have returns, the more we know about the investing process. So understand my focus is to help you have more than enough. And let me tell you why that's an important subject to me. There's a fellow by the name of John Bogle. Anybody know who John Bogle was? He's passed on. Anybody? A few of you, I see the heads. John Bogle was the man who invented the first index mutual fund. How many know what an index mutual fund is out of curiosity? Okay, it looks like about half. One of the most, and I'll talk about that today, one of the most important investments ever developed. But that, uh, uh, I must apologize, and I'll tell you right now, this is not the first time it'll happen. My mind goes blank from time to time because it goes somewhere else and then it comes back. But sometimes when it comes back, it doesn't bring back with it what I had when I was there before. So I have now forgotten, but it will happen again. This is one of the challenges of getting older. That does not stop me from being here, I'll tell you. Okay, let's talk about the things you must do in this, at this point where, by the way, how many are seniors? The hope was that we would have a lot of seniors here. Okay, well, we have a lot of seniors, but we have other people as well. That's fine, that's great. But as you move into the next stage of your life, the real world, uh, I always loved going to school. It was, I always felt like it, it, it wasn't, it was never hard. I, I, even when I had a family and had to work nights here on the campus to get by, it was never hard. It was always fun. But the real world, world is different. And there are things we need to do to be a success, to understand, to have control. A lot of people don't need control. They just do whatever's on their mind, whatever feels good. The problem is then that people like myself can't give you advice because what would feel good to us will be different than what feels good to you. And when you're a feel-good person, you do things that are normally emotional. We are trying to teach people to take the emotion out of the process. And one of the things that helps people control their emotion with money is to have a budget. And one of the things that is commonly prescribed is a budget that recommends 50% for needs, 30% for wants. Is there a difference between needs and wants? Yeah, it's big. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that there are differences because once you take some of those wants out of, your, out of your budget, you'll find that you've got money for the needs that are really important. But that's something you're going to come to. I remember when I was going to school before I was married and I was going to the University of Washington, I was spending $25 a month for, for rent. Actually, it wasn't $25. Two of us shared a room for $25. I paid $12.5 a month. It was a luggage room in a big house down by the University of Washington. We lived in a luggage room. Had to crawl over under a big pipe in order to get to the room. And I was a lower classman than my roommate, so I had to sleep on an air mattress underneath the shelf that we studied on. It is amazing how easy life is when you don't have much. But um, now that you're going to have much, and I hope it is a lot. In fact, I hope it is more than enough. And the reason more than enough, that's what I was thinking about a while ago. More than enough is so important. It's because we're optimistic as investors, as livers of life. We're hopeful. 
And we see things happening in a way that it just doesn't turn out. And so if we save for enough, and John Bogle wrote a book called Enough, a famous book. And, and basically what he said is we should try to have enough in what is enough. But if we are bad at, at predicting the future, then maybe we need to be saving and planning for more than enough so that if bad things happen that we weren't expecting, we have enough. The two guys I had breakfast with, one was supposed to have died 11 years ago with cancer. He's still alive. And uh, I, I asked him, because we have differences regarding politics, considerable differences, what he was worried about. And uh, I thought he was going to have a laundry list of things that would be uh, disagreeable to me. And instead, he said to get through the rest of the year. That's what he's worried about, not, not, uh, not uh, climate change or inflation, just get through the year. And, and his life, is, is, he had so many challenges in his life that cost him a lot of money that were nowhere in the plan. Some having to do with the loss of children. And the other guy was there. He graduated from Western in 1966. And he went to work for a company that had a reputation for being one of the best companies in the world in 1966. If you were going to put together a portfolio of stocks, you would definitely want to put this stock in the, in the portfolio because people who went to work for that company, even if you were a janitor, you would get rich because the company paid you profit sharing and you would get all this good stuff. The company was called Sears Roebuck. And as many of you know, Sears Roebuck has very little impact on the world today. And what started out like a, like a, a home run, you could picture a home run, was not a home run at all. And in my own case, and I'm not proud of this, but did I expect to be married four times? No. I expected to be married once forever planned on it, thought that would be the right thing to do. That first wife is still a friend, but it didn't, it didn't plan out, pan out the way that, that we planned. And then to do it again and again, it's crazy. I understand. I should have gotten therapy. That might have helped. But the bottom line is, my life was nothing like what I expected. But I ended up retiring at age 40 and retiring on enough, not extra, enough. And then as a hobby, just for fun, I started our investment management company that grew and grew and grew. And it's still there managing, I think they manage about $3 billion now. And it all started doing nothing more than teaching, me, teaching classes like this helping people be good do-it-yourself investors. And if they didn't want to do it themselves, we would do it for them. I stand here today ready to help you do it yourself, but I can't do it for you. So if you use our website and you, and you read the articles and you listen to the podcast, and I know in your life right now, that's not high on your list of things you want to do, don't do it now. Do it when you're ready to start investing. A young man came to our website from Amazon. He got his education on our website. And then he took all of the data that we have, because we have a ton of historical data for you to look at and to evaluate in terms of risk and return. That's what you need to understand. And it's not complex, by the way, not complex at all. It's just a bunch of numbers about what's happened in the past. This young fellow then took that information and he built a software package, a calculator, so that you can take our website and just turn it inside out with your own numbers. And he gave it to us as a present. And we, of course, 
give it to you to do what you can with it. I mean, we are really there to help. My email address, it's in the package, paul at paulmerriman.com. In the subject line, put WWU student, okay? Even when you're 30 and not a student anymore, I, I will know that you started from something you heard here. Now, the bad news is I may not wait, I may not make it to your 30, okay? The good news is we are trying to fund our foundation so that it continues after my work is done with other people who are willing to, to, to take the, the time. But the budget, I say, you build it on 90% wants and needs. And if you invest intelligently, and I mean intelligently based on understanding the risk of investing long-term and understanding how to put together a portfolio of different kinds of what we call asset classes, groups of stocks. Nah, never an individual stock, never. There is absolutely not one piece of evidence that says that investing is in your favor if you pick individual stocks. All of the literature concludes just the opposite. And by the way, when I talk about literature, it's important for you to know when anybody's ever talking to you about how you should invest, ask them the basis of what they are saying. Are you counting on Wall Street for your information? Are you counting on a neighbor, an uncle, somebody in the office, what we call Main Street? Or are you depending on what I call University Street, the academic community? And this will probably not surprise you. If given the choice between money hungry Wall Street, nice people, by the way, and your neighbor who might not even be telling you the truth, they might be bragging about how much they've made, but they're not telling you about the things that didn't work out. I don't tell everybody I've had four wives. <laughs> but University Street. They study it, they make conclusions, they write papers, they are peer reviewed by other people who would love to figure out the mistakes they've made. It all helps the information to be more dependable. But we also must understand there is nothing about the past that anybody can say is dependable because we don't know what the future will bring. And that's the risk that we all take when we put money aside for the long term, that it won't work out. And what I want you to do as an investor, because that's where, that's where most of the money you will have, if you are a good investor, you could make more money in what you do with your investments than what you do with the work that you do if you do it right. And so we wanna give you the evidence of what is the right looking backwards. But anytime we look backwards, we always know what we should have done, right? There is no risk in the past because I'm not gonna tell you about what didn't work. I'm gonna tell you about what did work. And one of the reasons that's an important thing to understand is that anytime you think about investing, you want as much diversification as you can, just in case part of what somebody said was gonna work doesn't work. And if you diversify enough, you're pretty safe long-term. I'll show that to you. Anyhow, thebalance.com. I gave you a URL of a great website about almost any subject about investing. They do not build portfolios for people like we do. Uh, we are not experts in everything and what we're experts in we'll crow about, but what we're not experts in we'll try to put you in the right hands to learn from somebody who does not have a conflict of interest.
course, make a plan to pay off your loans. Here again, there are so many ways to do this. I will tell you what it comes down to, the big decision point. And, and, and I gave you three URLs there from people who have written about this. Some people say, pay it off. You don't do anything else until you pay off your loans. Other people say, don't pay it off till you have to. Why do they say don't pay it off till you have to? Because they want to make sure that you take advantage of the investments that are likely to serve you well for the long term. Because, for example, if you have an, an, an investment in a, in, a, in a 401k and they're matching it, and you put up 6% of what you're making or 10% of what you're making, and they match that with free money, you can't miss that. You've got to take a second job if you have to. It is absolutely golden money that that you are able then to compound for the rest of your life, remembering that if you invest properly, you have an honest shot at doubling your money every six to seven years with part of your portfolio, not necessarily all of your portfolio, for part of your portfolio. So when you get a chance to put aside an extra $3,000 when you're in your early 20s, and then you double that every six or seven years, and you do that maybe five times, six times, it starts to be real money. So paying off the loans, are you surprised? The balance is there. Schwab is there. Studentloanhero.com is there. I want you, you probably know this. Do y'all know what affiliate programs are? Affiliate programs is where a lot of people make a lot of money on the internet, and sometimes it is so, is so evil. It's not, it's not even funny because they're recommending something that isn't really good for you, but they get a money every time you click there, or they get money every time you sign up for whatever their service is. Yet their review of the product is just over the top. I, I'm not even going to tell you who it is, but there's a, a money manager who has that kind of relationship. And every one of them say, this is a great place to, as a money manager for people who have a half a million dollars or more. And they talk about what a great company it is, but then they mention a few things that are wrong with it. They're really small things. And as a reader, I say, well, who cares about those little things? That's not very bad. It sounds like great people to deal with. They are not great people to deal with. And they have a trail of tears to prove it. And if you dig far enough on the internet about that particular company, you'll find the trail of tears. And you can imagine why I don't want to name them. Or I'd have a trail of tears. But that's one of the problems with the internet. So much of what we read there comes with an affiliate link. And if they can get you to hit that link, they get money. By the way, that's you know one of the reasons I am here is because I see the problem that you have as a, as a young person to be huge. Not only do you not have pensions, not only do you have to manage your own 401k, but you have somehow to get past Amazon, Facebook, um, Google, all the people. And by the way, they're not evil. They're just business people doing what business people do, maximizing their profits. Do you, anybody disagree with that? Nobody. And the problem is when I was your age, what, where, how could they get a hold of me? They could maybe come knock on my door and try to get me to join a church here in Bellingham. Or maybe they would get me because I would open up the Bellingham Herald and see an ad on the sports page or the comics. That was about it. Today, they get 40,000 shots a day, supposedly, 
imprints. And so from my viewpoint, the chances of you overcoming the desire for all these things that people want to build a picture that you should have this in your life, what a challenge. Which is, by the way, why I want you to invest before you start spending. Warren Buffett says, don't save what's left over after spending, but spend what's left over after saving. Save first, pay yourself. Don't give them a shot at that money. It is too valuable for the long run. I would put this number one, but I'd be booed by the industry. I want you to start investing in a Roth IRA or a Roth IRA as soon as you possibly can. Even if it's only a few hundred dollars, get the habit of saving. Why the Roth? Because remember I was talking about putting away $6,000 a year for five years, turning into 37 million or more if it's matched in a 401k plan. If it's in a Roth, that means it compounds hopefully in an investment that we'll talk about at 12% a year, and you never, ever have to pay any taxes on it. And when you die, you leave it to your children who then can take it out tax-free. They used, there was a, a, the ability in the past that you could take that out over a long period of time, but now they've changed the laws. They don't let you do that forever. On the, on, the, on the inheritance. But imagine that. If you could put away, not 6,000, 3,000. Well, 1,000 a year for six years in something that compounds tax-free. A regular IRA, a regular 401k. Understand that, yes, you get a tax deduction now, but later when you take the money out, you are taxed on everything you take out. Not true with a Roth. It's huge. When I was your age, the marginal tax rate for people who were making a lot of money was either 90% or the next year it was 70%. We have no idea how high taxes are going to be in the future. None. But think about that, being able to get money put aside in a Roth something, IRA or 401k, that could compound, and when you take it out, it doesn't matter what the tax rates are. Start saving for retirement. And by the way, the reason I want it to be a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k, not all 401ks allow a Roth. But some do. Roth IRAs are easy. Now, if I had to pick between an IRA and a 401k Roth, it would be that if the 401k didn't do any matching, I would recommend you do it with an IRA because you'll have more flexibility in what you invest in in an IRA than a 401k because in a 401k, you only have the choices that the company allows you to use. You'll find that out. How many already have a 401k? I'm not good, great. Way ahead. This is the most important table I'll show you. Uh, if I came to you and I said, I know a lot about investing. I've got a good track record. And I don't think you're gonna be able to do this yourself. It's just way, way too complex. I'm lying to you, by the way. Investing is not complex. It is not complex. I can teach a 12 year old to invest in a way that would be productive for the rest of their life. But I said to you, 
I will do it for you from the, from the day you can first put money in. Oh, it's only $100, no problem. I'll do it for you. And so for the rest of your life, somebody like me does it for you, and you pay me a half of 1%. By the way, that's half of what most managers get. Okay? So let's double it. Let's charge you 1%, which would be the amount that a regular manager would get. But you know, you've got $1,000 in there. What's 1%? It's 10 bucks. Seems like a pretty good deal. But we're going to do it for your whole life. You'll never have to worry about investing again. This table tells you what the real cost of that 1% is, even though this table is for a half of 1%. Here's the story. There are two people. One person is getting an 8% compound rate of return during the period of accumulation. And then they retire and they get a 6% return. And the reason they're getting 6% instead of 8% is because they're taking less risk because they're old. And when we get old, we take less risk, typically. Not everybody. I know lots of people who are all stocks all the time. And they've done great. But it takes a lot of risk tolerance. You get to retirement. And the rule of thumb is you can take out 4% a year. So, okay. You invest at 8% over 20, 40 years you've invested $240,000. At age 65, the portfolio value you'll see there is $1,678,000. This is table one. At age 95, the value of the portfolio is $2.8 million, and you took out $2.6 million. You add up the 2.8 and the 2.6, that is your honest return for all those years of saving, how much you were able to spend out of that portfolio and how much you were able to leave to others. And for some people, you'll get there because you saved a lot more but didn't invest very intelligent, uh, without, with, with very little risk tolerance. Other people maybe saved less, but they took more risk. There are all sorts of different ways to get to the same dollar amount. But the total of those two is what you did during your lifetime. And if you did that, you would have a total of $5.45 million. From having invested $240,000 over a period of 40 years, doesn't that look like a reasonable amount of money to have? I mean, is 8% feel good? No, yes. How many say it, it feels good? Nobody. You want more or you want less? No. All right. If we could just add another half of 1%. But you paid that half a percent to me. And you would still be worth the 5.5 because I'm getting a half a percent for managing the money for you. And you're ending up with that 5.5 million. I was hoping at least one person would say they'd be happy with that. I can tell you very few people have done that well. I can tell you that. We know what the average returns of real people are. They're not that. They have not gotten 8%. The mutual funds may have gotten 8%. But they didn't because they were moving around and trying to do the right thing, which I don't want you to do that. It hurts you more than it helps you. But basically, that means that that half a percent you're paying me is what I'm worth to tell you what funds to be in. Are you with me on that? How much did I get paid? Give me the number, somebody. $1.527 million. You see that? It's there. The difference, the difference between making 8% and 8.5% is $1.527 million. 
Would it be worth 20 hours of your time to learn how to do this and keep that money in your family? I'm serious. That's the payoff for taking the time to learn how to invest on your own. And please, you know, if, you, if, if, if this is irritating you or you think in any way it's being misrepresented or I'm being too optimistic, if this is too optimistic, wait till you see what I've got for you in a few minutes. It's going to get much better. I'll get more hands next time I ask. You see why I want you to learn how to make an extra half of 1%? Every half of 1% that you learn to make makes you an extra million and a half dollars if all you do is put away $6,000 a year. You are going to put away a lot more than $6,000 a year. You're hopefully going to put at least 10% away. The experts say you should put away 20. I see what people are being paid these days, starting. I can't believe it. My grandson graduates from college with a bachelor's, and he, and he, and, and he gets $135,000 $135, a year, and he gets a $25,000 bonus for signing. And then, by the way, he decided to be a creative writer instead. <laughs> and I just heard his first story. Amazing. He's going to be good. Talk about not knowing where we're going to be. I mean, I read once that between the time that we get out of college and age 30, that, that young people have seven different jobs. Does that sound right? No. I hope that that page, because I'm looking for half so, oh, in the book, in the book, I give you eight plus extra half percent advantages at your beck and call. Eight of them. And every one of them is easy. I want you to notice something from that table as we look at the next table. It's a partnership this thing that you're about to do with investing or already are doing, it doesn't work without you. It doesn't work because if you didn't put that $240,000 in there, you wouldn't have gotten to the five point whatever million. It is a partnership and in the early years of the partnership, you are the most important partner. It is your money in the early years that make the difference. Remember when I talked about going from those, those five years of $6,000 a piece that turns into $37 million eventually? At the end of five years, you want to feel rich? How would you feel having about $42,000? dollars you put in thirty, dollars and it's only worth about forty two. dollars what kind of path to, to stardom is that? To getting filthy rich, what is that? It's because in the early years, it's not about the investment. I mean, the value of the returns. It is about the money that you get in the account, earning the money for the long term. What this table shows you is the importance of adding more money. We talked about starting with 6,000. But what would happen if instead of just 6,000, every year you added one or two or 3% more? And by the way, if you do that, you're probably keeping up with inflation. So it's not like this is a unusual thing to do. And it is, by the way, I think a great way to kind of quietly build the portfolio over time. Because look, let's just look at the 3% a year. I mean, doesn't 3% a year sound reasonable? You know, you put in $6,000 and then the next year you put in 6,180. It's gonna cost you another $15 a month. I know that's not impossible. But if you had done that, 
I look at the at the bottom part of this chart, the person who made eight and six and 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 and, and took out the the uh, uh, and took out the four percent a year. The total of what they uh, took out by adding in the three percent a year was seven point eight million. Versus before, without adding the extra money, was about five point five. When you go to the eight and a half and six and a half. Then it was uh, for three percent a year, nine point eight million. You see that, and uh, compared to no increases of six point about seven million. So you know there's 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 a good three million dollars more because you increase the ante by three percent a year. And then if you want to knock it out of the park, and remember, I got that book has about eight ways to add a half a percent. I'm talking about finding two ways to, to add a half a percent. So you go from eight to nine percent instead of eight and a half, six to seven percent instead of six and a half, and now you're up to 12 million when you add that three percent a year. Are you seeing how important your part of the partnership is? You are not a passive player in this. I'm I'm curious, how many of you feel like you are savvy about investing in mutual funds? Now, I don't mean that you're a great expert, you know everything, but you feel pretty comfortable in this conversation. Okay, not, not very many. So I want to take you through the three greatest investment products of all time and, and, and why they should be part of your life. The first one is mutual funds, second are index funds, and the third is what's called the target date funds. I want all three of these to be in your life. That is what I'm hoping for. The mutual funds. Mutual funds are simply a pooling of money from a whole lot of people. And handing that money over to professional managers and then having them do everything for you. They pick the stocks. When it's time to sell the stocks, they sell the stocks. I mean, they do everything for you. They report the taxes. Uh, they do all the administrative. They keep track of everything. You don't have to do anything but put money in. They started in 1920s. They were started for the kids of rich people because they wanted to find a efficient way to manage money for the children of the very wealthy because they were already doing it for the very wealthy, but they weren't called mutual funds. They grew to be this mammoth industry. Vanguard alone has, but well, I don't know about the end of today, but they have in the neighborhood of six to seven trillion dollars under management. And there are others that actually have more. It's huge, but you have somebody taking care of that money for you. They're broadly diversified. You put in a hundred dollars. You have the diversification of a multimillionaire right there with that hundred dollars. It's the same diversification. It is an amazing product. You can go in with a hundred dollars. In fact, in some cases you can go in, in at fidelity with any amount you want. At Schwab, they have mutual funds, no minimum. Fidelity even has some, not only no minimum, but no internal expenses. No cost to run the money for you. You have one day liquidity, well, during the week. You can say, I quit, want to sell it, and you're out. Now, the next group of funds uh, are index funds. This is, was started by John Bogle in 1976. It's interesting because his life didn't go as expected. Just like most of us, our lives do not go as expected. He got fired from a company, was looking for something to do in a sense. And what he did is what he started a mutual fund that changed the face of investing forever. 
because instead of hiring somebody who would pick the best stocks and, and, and decide when to buy them and when to sell them and do everything that they knew how to make you more money. And I, I was a stockbroker for a couple of years back in the 60s. And that's what we had to sell. We had these actively managed funds. And the sales pitch was, these are really smart people who know how to make you money. We didn't have a benchmark we were competing against. The only thing that we did was the fund spit out a return and then the client either liked it or they didn't like it. And then there were people who were comparing the mutual funds. And of course, the people wanted to be in the most productive mutual funds, not understanding that the most productive mutual funds recently are the ones that are likely to become unproductive next. But that's the way it was. Expenses were very high and it cost you eight and a half percent low to commission if you put in $1,000, $85 immediately went into my pocket instead of yours to grow for decades and to grow in your children's accounts for more decades. Index fund, no load, no commission. Index funds, very low expenses, usually as much as about 1% cheaper than the actively managed funds where they, these, the active managers are, are out there saying, take me, take me, see what I did last year, see what I did the last five years, I am amazing. And of course, the academic research says, yes, you are amazingly lucky. Because so often, so often, that that people thought was so great turns out to be very mediocre but the index funds end up over time in the top 10%. You go out 20 years and you compare the returns of the index funds to the actively managed mutual funds. And one of the reasons is because the, 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 the expenses are lower. But that is whatever the reason might be, that is where the probabilities of success are in your favor. I mean, it's almost like we had 10 doors up here that, that, that you want to pick that's going to be better than the, mute, than, the, than the index fund. And you don't know what's behind each one of those doors. And I, and I open up the index fund return. Now, one of those other nine funds up there is going to be better than that index fund. What are your odds? And why would you take those odds when you can be in the one that is always, let's say, second best? And the one that is first in one decade is not the same as the one that's first in the second decade. But the first, I mean, the, the second one is still the index fund. Have you got that? I mean, it, it, does that make sense? But remember, that is not what Wall Street wants you to do. They want you to do something that makes them money. No, that's not what we want. We want something that maximizes what you make. And you'll say, well, is that fair? Can we treat Wall Street like that? Trust me. How many of there are of you here? This is not. If you all invested intelligently for the rest of your life, and you cheated Wall Street out of 1% a year, or maybe 2% a year, because there are other ways they make money off of you, do you think that's going to change their life? Is it going to change your life, is what I want to know. My view is yes. It may not be an easy road to get there, which is the challenge. And by the way, academic studies, I love this. Index funds like the S&P 500, they have 500 different companies in them. Actively managed funds that are trying to beat the S&P 500 by bobbing and weaving and all, they normally have like 100 different stocks or maybe 200 different stocks. The studies show that the more diversification you have, the higher the return you're likely to get. That is a little counterintuitive but it's so according to the studies. And then the granddaddy of them all. Because if you want, let me ask this question. 
How many of you want to manage your own portfolio for the rest of your life? You want to make the decisions. If, if, if the management were free, would you want to manage your, yourself if you could get the management for free? Or would you like to turn it over to professionals to do it for you? I mean, how many would want a professional to do it for you for the rest of your life? You just want to put the money in there and believe it's being managed properly. A few, most of us. Here is the product. It started in 1993. It is a game changer for 99% of the people. Most people do not want to make the decision, and they don't know who the heck to trust to do it for them. But the target date fund, which can be built from index funds. So you have the mutual fund inside of a target date fund, inside of a target date fund, and the mutual fund that's inside of the target date fund is an index fund. So you have all three of these great products, the mutual fund that is built like an index fund inside of an umbrella that is managed for the date you're going to retire. Not the day, but the year or the approximate year. So you can buy a target date fund for 2065. And that means that professional mutual fund managers in an index-like capacity are going to manage that portfolio and have you almost all in equities in the early years. And as you get older and older and older, by the time you're my age, they'd probably have you 40% in equities and 60%, pardon me, in fixed income. Because by the time we get old, we can't earn ourselves out of any problem. See, when you're young, you'll be making money to earn yourself out of any problems that you have. When you're old and you don't have the capacity to work anymore, then you need to make sure that what you have there is more stable. So remember the pension funds I talked about ever so briefly earlier. There you have people who are managing that money professionally. What are they managing it for? They're managing it to make sure that when the people who work for that company are going to be paid when the people retire. So they have to invest in a way that addresses when the money is going to be needed. That's the way the target date fund is managed. But it's managed in a sense for one person. All the people man, are retiring in 2065 or 2060, or 2055, just every five years. Here is the best news I can possibly bring to you. Target date funds have been studied both by Wall Street and by University Street. Wharton did a study of 1.2 million 401k plans through Vanguard, the Vanguard family of funds. What they wanted to know is what is the difference in expected return from the investors that did and didn't use target date funds? Now, in some cases, some people had a mixture of target date funds and a do-it-yourself portfolio. Because when you're in a 401k, if it's, any, if it's any good at all, it will have target date funds inside the 401k. But it'll have other things you could invest in. There's one particular fund I'm hoping they'll have. I'll address that in just a second. So what do we learn from that study? The people who were trying to do it themselves had an expected rate of return that was 2.3% less per year than the target date funds. Which means that the people who thought they were being smart doing, doing things to be better because, you know, who wants an old target date fund that anybody can get into? It turns out actually did a lot 
better. Which means if, if you're in the group of people who say, please, I don't want to do anything, target date fund is the answer, a phenomenal answer. I want you to do it if you can at Vanguard or some mutual fund family, and Fidelity does it too, that does it with index funds. Not all of these things are done with index funds. But there's one thing I don't like about, well, a couple of things I don't like about the target date funds. One is they'll have 10% of the portfolio for your age people in bonds. I just get furious that you would be tied up with 10% of your money in bonds because bonds, when you, when you, when you take, put 10% of your money in bonds, your expected rate of return goes down one half percent a year. So any bonds as a, as a 20, a 21, 22, 31, 32, 40, that bond is, is hurting your return. But the target date funds seem like to think they have a responsibility to make the average person think they're thinking about that other side of the market. And by having 10% in bonds, it is giving them some, some sense of, of comfort. It's, all it does is keep you from putting more money in better investments by putting money in bonds, but that's the way it is. And the other thing that they don't have enough of, they don't have, in fact, they have almost no small cap companies, almost no value companies. And I wanna talk about that because I want you to do something about it. And here's what I think is gonna make a difference. How many people out of curiosity just don't like numbers? Okay, I see you. I feel your pain. I like them if they tell me a story that helps me make more money. I like them if they represent a period of time that is somehow legitimate. See, if you tell me about something about 10 years, I don't care about 10 years. 10 years can be a, a random event, but 50, 60, 70, 80, I like that when I've got lots of evidence. Now, here's what we know. This page, equity returns. 94 years worth of returns in four different kinds of investments. They're all stocks. They are all built to grow, but they represent different levels of risk. And those different levels of risk are because either the companies are bigger or the companies are, I mean, the, the smaller companies would be more risky. The bigger companies would be less risky. Companies that are value companies, companies that are struggling, they have a problem. They're, they're not as popular as the growth companies. The companies that if I asked you to make a list of the, your 10 companies you know, I can almost guarantee that at least eight of those 10 are going to be recognized. You know, Microsoft and Google and those are the growth companies. Those are not value companies. Those are companies that people are willing to pay very high prices for their earnings. But the other companies that aren't so good, not so exciting, but working their tail off, making a living, trying to make something for the shareholders, those companies are called value companies. But I want you to see you see in the first column that says USLCB, see it there? Large cap blend. Those are big, really big companies. Average size company is over 100 billion. If you multiply the number of shares times the share price on the market, some of them are even worth more than a trillion, or they were until recently. Then in the next, call, oh, by the way, notice over the last 94 years, that particular asset class, that kind of stock as a group, owning all of them like an index. This is the index return over that 94 year period. 
hypothetical because it didn't exist. But they can go back and put all those companies together and they can run the numbers. The column says US LCV, large cap value, big companies, but out of favor. They compounded at 11.2. Small cap blend, these are not $100 billion companies. These are two, three, four, five, six billion dollar companies. They're not penny stocks, but they are small companies. And their compound rate of return as a group, 12.1. And by the way, included in that 12.1 are a lot of companies that failed. By the way, also in the, in the large cap blend, a lot of companies that were in there failed. All those failures are included in those returns. And finally, the gold ring of asset classes in the U.S. is small cap value. And that was 13.4%. Remember, I'm looking for a half a percent to make you better. And so when I think about that target date fund that doesn't have any small or small cap value in the portfolio, I just don't want to take them and shake them. What's wrong with you? Well, you know, those small companies, sometimes they... They, they do, don't do as well. And then if people see that something is there is not doing well, they're going to want to know why are you holding companies that aren't doing well? And after all, they're small, risky companies anyway. They're trying to keep the client in the product rather than educate them. And the payoff for the education is huge because all you have to do is take 9% of your money you're going to save and have that go into the target date fund and 1% go into the small cap value kind of fund. There's an index fund for small cap value. Just like there's an index for the S&P 500. And if you feel a little more adventuresome, maybe you do 8% into target date and 20% into small cap value. I, that is not like you're taking a big risk. Not at all. Now, just for what it's worth, if you follow your finger across the top of that, you have those other portfolio, there's other groups. See that one to the far right, US2 fund, S&P 500 and a small cap value, 50-50, half in each. That compound rate of return is 12.1. You could have half of your money in the S&P 500. You could feel safe with that. And the other half, you think I have pedal to the metal there. I'm trying to get more. I'm trying to take more risk. I still want hundreds and hundreds of stocks, companies in my portfolio. It's not that there's less diversification, it's just a whole bunch. And by the way, it is amazing how different. Anybody here by chance follow small cap value as an asset class, anybody? No, yes. And has it not been a good thing to own this year? It's been, compared to the S&P 500, it's been great. Now, I own both. In fact, I own 10 different kinds of asset classes, but you can accomplish with these two asset classes about everything that I accomplish owning 10 different equity asset classes. And again, remember, you should be almost all in equities with your long-term money at your age. Now, let me address the people. Uh, and I, and this, is, this is another reason I come up here. There are so many people who have a feeling of, um, of myths. They're myths about investing. Now, maybe that group isn't here today, but are there, is there anybody here who has that sense that equities are really pretty risky 
And it's very much like gambling. Anybody? Nobody. Nobody feels that investing in equities is too much risk to take for the long term. That's fantastic. Yes. Uh, I think you could find just finding one stock is really risky. Yes, one stock would be very, very risky. One, one stock is a speculation, not an investment. Uh, that's a good point. I want to show you something. I had hoped at least one person would say, yes, I don't like the idea of being in a market that goes up and down and up and down. I just can't believe it. It's the first time this has ever happened. I want you for a second to go to the next, uh, the next table. This is all of the 40 year periods since 1928. If somebody had said to me that they were afraid of the volatility of their investment and of losing everything, because some people who, who think about the stock market have this picture of it's, it's, it's a, it is an exposure to losing everything. Yes, people lost everything with Eastern Airlines and they Enron and Washington Mutual, uh, General Motors went through it, a bankruptcy. There was a time in this country, in fact, in 66, General Motors would have been one of the companies you probably would have invested in because the old saying was, as goes General America goes, so goes America. They attach those two companies kind of as one in terms of, of thinking in, about success. But notice, under the large cap blend category, this is the compound rate of return is 11%. That's the average over 40 years. The very best was 12 and a half. But notice what the very worst is, 8.9%. In other words, there is at least a belief that if you start investing and you're putting money away, it's not going away permanently as long as you're in a diversified portfolio. But at least historically, including the depression and all, the worst 40 years was in fact a gain of 8.9% a year. And to make it even more interesting, that was a period of time when inflation was really, really low. So it turned out that after inflation, 8.9% was a pretty good return. All right. Paul, yes. We had a question come in the chat. Oh, good. What is that question? It was, it was back on your comments about bonds. And if you could repeat it so people could hear it through the mic. That was okay. The comment, it's a question about bonds coming to you. The question is, what about the current I-bond rate of nearly 10%? Is that a problem? Uh, is the current, now, that's a very special uh, situation. The, the, the current I-bond list uh, event that is tied, it's got about a 10% return. No, that is something that what everybody should go do, short term, short term, is to go find out how you can take advantage of buying an I-bond that pays 10%. You're limited as how much you can put in it, but it is a special situation and certainly would be a smart thing for people to do. Is there a place they could go to find out more? Just, just actually just do a search okay. uh, and, and you'll find, you'll find that. No, that's a very special situation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Treasuries. Uh, the next page is I just, I didn't have a chance to see these uh, up close. At my age, I have no idea what's on this page. Now, actually I do. I love this page. And, and, and I want you to see something. If you're gonna come to our site and take advantage of our site, we have over 160 pages of tables. Why do we do that? Because every, every page, whether it's a page about accumulating money or about taking money out, is all based on the, on the data from past returns. In some cases, going back to 1928, in many cases like this one, going back to 1970. Because what we really want you to understand, and I, I won't spend, I, I don't have very much time left and I do wanna take questions. We have, we had any other questions that have come in? 
that were entered when we registered it. Okay, that's great because I think we have 15 more minutes left. This table is, is a great learning tool. The mission of our foundation is to give people the tools and the information to make lifetime investment decisions and to be able to actually do them. We, at, we give you the names of the mutual funds to be in if you want to do other kinds of things that we talk about. What funds at Vanguard? What funds at Fidelity? What funds uh, uh, in ETFs to the extent that you might be an exchange traded fund investor? Too much for this presentation, but here's what this table does for us. It looks at 52 years worth of data. And that data represents on the far left-hand side, how did the S&P 500 do one year at a time? And so if you had any interest in that, you could just run your finger down, pretend you were living through it, and you'd see that this could be kind of a fright simulator because not only do you see the good times, but you see the bad times. And then down at the bottom of that column, it'll show you the return for that period, the compound rate of return was 11%. It's a very good compound rate of return. Then we want you to understand this came with risk. So we show you the worst three months, the worst six months, the worst 12 months, the worst 36 months, the worst 60 months, and finally the worst drawdown from a peak to a valley. How much did you have to lose? before it went back up and started making money again. And in that particular case, it was 51%. That is a risky, and by the way, that's the common amount of risk that you get in a diversified equity fund when it's all equities. But what if on the far right side, we did the same thing where it says 100% US SCV, that's the small cap value. We can then look at every year since 1970, a small cap value. And we can also combine those two and see what would it look like if we had 50-50, 40-60, 60-40 to help you get a sense of how things move around as you decide to move around. If you look down, for example, at the small cap value itself, it compounded at 14%. In that, in that strategy I talked about, I'm hoping you'll get 12%. I mean, the amount of money you'll have later in life if you get 12, it's huge. You double your money every six years. Notice the 50-50 in the middle of the page, and you go down to the 50-50, 12.7%. Worst drawdown, 55.8%. Yes, it fell a little bit more. But by the time you've lost 50%, quite honestly, a little bit more, is that's, that's not that much. You'll already be traumatized. These tables... And sometimes, most of the time, we have bonds over here on the left. So you can decide how much in stocks and how much in bonds. When I was an investment advisor, if you came into my office, I had these tables in my, in my desk here. And I might talk with you for an hour, hour and a half. And I would say, ah, I know what tables I need to show, you know, I reach in there, I pull out one table of 160. And I say, here's what I think is right for you. And hopefully at that time, they either trusted us or, or they didn't. If they didn't, then they didn't become clients. If they did, then they knew what I thought was best for them. My problem here today is I don't sit down with people anymore. So I have to pro provide to you the information in, sense, in a sense that I needed as an investment advisor to help others. But if you're going to be your own investment advisor, you need to know this information to make the decision. 
it's complex, isn't it? Which is why for a lot of people, that's why the target date fund is the right answer. And in that book, I, I imagine I already said this, in that book, the last half of that book is about combining a target date fund with small cap value. If you were going to build your own target date fund, I would probably use this combination for the equity part of your portfolio and then figure out how to invest the bonds with it and when to change. And by the way, when to change, look and see when everybody else changes because they all show their glide. It's called a glide path. I want to make sure that I get to, uh, well, there's that in, in, in readable numbers. Um, and there's that 50-50. Well, anyway, I'm not going to. Um, I want to talk about this. I don't care if you do this with $100 a year, $1,000 a year, $500. I don't care. I hope you do it, though, with something. Because I think once you experience this, you have, you have 70 plus years to put this stuff to work. Uh, and so however gently we can get you there, that's fine. And, and, and so I want to talk about this strategy. This is the article we're working on right now. I talked about this earlier. We assume you are going to put away $6,000 a year. I don't know if I talked about it with this class. I did the last class. When you have a child, my hope is you will review this strategy again and that you will start an account at the birth of that child at $25 a month. And to put that money into small cap value at $25 a month for 21 years. And at the end of 21 years, that person will, child will graduate from Western, I'm sure. And at that point, that $25 a month will have grown. Who knows if it gets 12% annualized over that period of time to enough to fund those five years of $6,000. And you do that for them as they earn money. You make them promise they will not cash it out. You make them read my book. And uh, you tell them they also agree to do this for somebody else when they can do it. Because it is such a simple way. By the way, it doesn't have to be $25 a month. It could be $10 a month. Whatever you can afford. But to fund what you can for that five years, because that first five years, that, that will potentially allow, well, it's the first six years will allow for another double later on. And let me tell you something. In that first six year, five years, you may have the greatest five years ever in the stock market. That was from 1995 to 1999. It compounded at 28 and a half percent. The S&P 500 small cap value compounded at 22%. It was an amazing period of time. And if you had started during that five years, you, you would believe things that aren't believable because you would start compounding in your mind that, well, I'm not going to get 28 and a half, but certainly 20 is possible. And it won't be. You may, you know, that seems so interesting. In 1999, people were surveyed. What return do you expect for the next 10 years? The average return was over 20%.
How could they possibly believe that based on 60, 70, 80 years worth of data? That didn't matter. All that mattered were the last five. That's the way we think. The biggest hurdles we have as investors are psychological, believing things that aren't true. But let's say, thanks. Let's say that, I wish I could do that, by the way. Let's say that those were five terrible years. Is that good or is that bad? That's good. That is great if they happen to be five bad years, because that means the money you're investing, you're not investing in WAMU or Eastern or, Air or Enron. You're investing in great companies that at that point are for some reason under pressure in the eyes of investors. And so you're buying this stuff dirt cheap because when it turns around and all you have to do is you look after 73, 74, the bear market, how the market did for the next five, eight years, amazing. You look after 2000 through 2002, amazing. You look at after 2007 through 2009, amazing if you could have been a buyer in those bad times as well as the good times. So you can't lose in those first five years. It can feel like you did. And by the way, I never make any guarantees, except that I won't be around forever, and nor will you. And the idea is while you are here, do those things that are in your best interest. You set the example and more than likely your children will follow. I really believe that. And what we know is, is that the people who are most savvy about investing are people who have learned about it, not in classes, but have learned about it in conversation around the table. And to the extent that this is a, a conversation that becomes, and I don't mean that it's, this is not about spending our life talking about money. But money is one subject that seems to come up every day of our life, right? You can't get away from it. Well, my wife was in this retreat in India at one time where she got away from it, but it cost her a fortune to get there. <laughs> so our job at the foundation is to educate. Your job is to do all you can. As a matter of fact, there is something you can do for us. Share the book. I give it to you free. I don't want you to have your friends buy it. I want you to go to our website and you sign up and you get a, a link to the book, a PDF. It's free. If you knew a thousand people and you sent this book to a thousand people because you thought it would help them you will be in my prayers because I'm trying to figure out how do we get this book into the hands of a million young people? And the problem is there aren't very many of you that want to learn it. That's the challenge. I mean, I wish I understood. In fact, it would be interesting to me for those, the two things. If you read the book and you, no, if you read the book, it would be wonderful if you would go to Amazon and do a review about the book. We've had 99 written reviews. Many of them are people who bought the book. Many of them are people who got the PDF. 96 of those are five-star reviews. Three of them are four-star reviews. And I don't know how much you know about reviews at Amazon, but for me, that's amazing. And only one of them was a friend. I mean, I didn't go out and find people to go here and give me, but, but it would be helpful because, and particularly if you do a review, tell them you're a student, because that means other students might see that and they, if they want to buy the book, they can buy the book. Those reviews are really important. Uh, if there's any way that you end up in a place where our educational material will help, call me. 
call me. I am, uh, I'm able to help. As I am able, I, I will help. And, uh, and I know that my time is, is, is up. And, and do you have a question there? There is one, last, one other question that other people might have, mm -hmm. um, which is how do you get a Roth IRA? Can you get it through a credit union or do you have to go with someplace like Fidelity? How do you get a Roth IRA? Yes, credit unions, banks, Fidelity, insurance companies, I'm sure. No load index, remember. Don't pay a commission to get into a mutual fund ever in your life. Because that money in the commission from that mutual fund compounds in somebody else's pocket forever. It's a serious loss. And, and, and Schwab or Vanguard, you should learn how to use uh, Schwab or Vanguard because they are low cost, um, Vanguard is the biggest uh, in that group, uh, and they have lots of great index funds, and we have recommendations for Vanguard funds. Is there a question burning somebody's mind right now? Yes. What do I think of investing in markets outside the U.S.? I do half of my investments are in international, in the equity part of my portfolio. You don't need them. What you need is you need to make sure you have access to large cap blend, large cap value, small cap blend, and small cap value. And let me tell you why I say you don't need it. If I build one of the portfolios we have built, it's the worldwide four fund portfolio. It is 25% in US large cap blend, 25% in U international large cap value. 25% in international small cap blend and 25% in US small cap value. So it's half international, half US, half small. I mean, all these same pieces, but spread around the world. The return is the same. It's having those asset classes in your portfolio. What does international give you? It gives you some additional diversification around the edges at certain times, but not very often. And so often people don't trust the international markets for one reason or enough, another. And so uh, I think you can do the same thing in the US market. If the US market collapses, and by the way, that's the reason we diversify internationally because bad things happen to good people. And those good people can be countries. And there's a whole, there's a whole long history of Egypt was the fifth best market in the world a hundred years ago. So we could be the dog one of these days. We just don't know it. It's a hard thing to understand. Home bias is a very strong feeling. There's a book called Your Money and Your Brain by Jason Zweig. It's all about the psychological aspects of investing. And in there, he talks about the New Zealand market and the Greek market. And the people in Greece and New Zealand are as committed to their country as we are committed to ours as investors. And think of the problems that Greece has had. Uh, it's fascinating, the, the home bias that we have. But the beauty is you can get access to that small value, that, that small blend, that large value, that large blend right here at, at, at less than one-tenth of 1% 1 on average over those four funds, an annual fee. You're keeping almost everything. It's wonderful. Thank you. And email me if you have any comments to make about what you got out of tonight, what you've gotten out of Western, ways that you might like us to work harder to help you more. I read those emails, just send them to me personally. I can't hide, okay? Thank you.